Time frame of the 4,500 years of Noah's flood. Hennep or Lyell's work was fiction, yet everybody who read Lyell's book thought it was the Bible that was fiction. It was a great deception. But it gets better than that. You'll notice that in the gorge, if you get a chance, it's got a thick limestone cap, as I previously mentioned, and underneath that is soft shale. It's the shale, really, that's being eroded out. As you go downstream farther, the limestone is thinner, which means the erosion rates were higher. The erosion rates were higher, probably higher than 12 feet per year, going back in history when you take a look at the geology. Furthermore, when you get downstream, you'll notice the gorge comes down is quite wide. It takes a sharp turn, and if you take a walk along the gorge on the, on the bottom, you'll notice the gorge is really narrow. You can almost throw a rock from Canada to the US extremely narrow and then it takes a dog's leg right hand turn at the whirlpool what on earth is going on there when they built that bridge right there so railroad bridge it's abandoned now they're not using it uh, but the bridge is still there when they drilled for the pilings they didn't hit rock what they hit was gravel it was a long way down before they finally hit rock what, it, what they discovered later on, this is a previous gorge that was eroded through the Niagara Escarpment. It's called the St. David's Gorge. You can actually go there and study it yourself. So it isn't solid rock, it's just dirt and gravel. And what happened is the Niagara River started cutting upstream, and when it hit here, it took a left turn and followed the old gorge. It just washed away the dirt and rock. So you've got several hundred meters here, that probably eroded like that. So once again, when we go back in the past and we look at the geology, Lyell was out to lunch. Lyell wasn't even remotely close. His numbers were fiction. But everybody who read Lyell's work concluded it was the Bible that was fiction. Uh, just to give you a, a quick lowdown, here's the St. David's Gorge. Right now, there are major hydroelectric projects on the Canadian and US side. The Canadian side is one I want to pay attention to because they ducted water around this way and cut across the St. David's Gorge. They actually had to build concrete flumes in order to keep the water contained. They had to, because the water would have just eroded all the dirt away and they wouldn't have had uh, the, uh, the sluice way for the water. You can actually see down here, that's where they hit limestone again. So they had to fill all this in with concrete in order not to lose their water into the old St. David's Gorge. So the geology disproves Lyell. There's the, uh, the infill. You can imagine, look at how fast it's eroding now. <laughs> you can imagine if you run the Niagara River through that. Okay, moving right along. This is another place that Charles Lyell visited. It's called the Temple of Serapis. When Lyell took a look at them, he noticed that about a third of the way up, you can actually see a line, and then above that, right up to there, are all these pits that were drilled into the marble pillars. Now what this was, these were actually made by a little clam, a bivalve, that actually bores into limestone and bores into rock. That's how it anchors itself. And so this is actually a whole pile of pits made by clams. Now Lyell is correct in his conclusion. His conclusion was that the land sunk. It sunk into the Black Sea for a time and then rose again. He's correct. And that line is where the dirt and the bottom of the sea was. So as it sunk, the pillars went underwater. Some of the sediments covered part of the pillar. And the part that was exposed was actually eaten up by little clams, little bivalves. Now, when Lyell saw this, he said, aha, this is perfect. Because remember, he is trying to discredit the flood. 
He's trying to come up with his own history. And so what he did is he looked at that and he said, oh, this is perfect. The land sunk. We don't need a global flood anymore. The land can sink and you can have a local flood producing sedimentary layers, just like we saw up to the bottom of the pillar. So he just disqualified the history according to Moses, the global flood. He disqualified the global flood by saying the land locally sunk. I'll show you why that's wrong in just a minute, okay? But for the moment, he is correct. What happened in this area, a huge volcanic eruption happened, and as is common with volcanoes, the land sunk. You get all this magma that shifts around, and so the land sinks. The temple obviously sunk with it, and then the land rose again later on. He's correct. However, this cannot explain why we get layers around the world. First of all, did that take a long geologic time? No. It happened almost overnight. The volcano erupted, the land sunk fast. This doesn't back up the millions of years. This is a, an example of catastrophe. So I'm going to come back to that later on. Another place Charles Lyell visited, the G Cliffs of Joggins in Nova Scotia. If you get the chance, you want to go there. It's an excellent place. There's a picture of the cliffs there. Those are about 80 feet high, roughly. It is some of the most fantastic geology and fossils I have ever seen on planet Earth. Just incredible. You can walk along 18,000 vertical feet of sediments. 18,000 feet. How much is in the Grand Canyon? 3,500 feet plus the basement. So this blows the doors off the Grand Canyon by at least threefold. You can actually, because you'll notice, God has very kindly tilted the layers. So we can actually walk along the beach and study 18,000 feet of sediments and fossils from the comfort of strolling down the beach. Now if you do go, bring a helmet. These cliffs, they collapse all the time, okay? Don't hang around them, it's not a good idea, okay? And uh, the reason the cliffs are there, this is also the highest tides in the world. The water goes up and down 45 feet twice a day. Take my word for it, don't be there at high tide, okay? Trust me on that one. Uh, especially downstream, or uh, more towards the mouth of the Bay of Fundy. That's nasty. Now, within these cliffs, you have lots of fossil polystrate trunks from giant plants. Uh, for example, that trunk there is, oh, roughly this big around. Okay, give you an idea. You'll notice it goes vertically through the rock. And they're all over the place. And any time you go there, you can see 30 to 50 uh, different upright polystrate plants, easily. Now, Lyell went there uh, as part of his research, and the evidence is obvious. It's all, do you think the top of that plant stuck around for millions of years while it slowly got buried? Nonsense. But do you think Lyell would come to that conclusion? Nope. <laughs> Lyell instead insisted, and this is still the predominant theory today, by the way. As nonsensical as it is, it is still the predominant belief. The predominant belief is that these trees were buried where they grew. In other words, they were growing there, they grew, and the sediments came up slowly and buried the plant. That is still the predominant belief today. This is possibly a record at Joggins. Uh, I didn't know that at the time. This was the first time I ever went there. But you can see the trunk there. That's about, uh, about this big around. So it's a big tree. By the way, they're not trees. They're giant hollow reeds. They're still alive today. Today they grow in my backyard. They get about this tall. In the fossil record, that same plant gets almost 120 feet tall. Everything in the fossil record was bigger. I'll come back to that later on. Uh, dragonflies, for example. How big do dragonflies get nowadays? Six, seven inches? There's one from the Solenhofen Formation in Germany that they found with a four-foot wingspan. Uh, everything in the past was bigger. <laughs> uh, you can imagine that hitting your windshield at 75 miles an hour. That would be nasty. Okay, so the trunk here goes in behind the mud. There's mud washing down the cliff all the time. And it actually outcropped up here. This is actually the cavity left behind. That is a branch still there today. That's cutting through almost 30 vertical feet of sediments. Geologically speaking, we've all been told those layers took thousands to millions of years to accumulate. Hogwash. That plant is not going to stick around complete with branches still around for thousands. It's not even going to stick around for 10 years while it gets buried. 
let alone thousands or millions. It's nonsense. But that is still the predominant belief. This is clear evidence of a major flood. Now, last I checked, okay, you can see this beautiful fossil here, okay, again, an upright trunk. If you look carefully, you can actually see a root comes down and comes back up and actually comes above what would have been ground level. That is what we call negative geotropism. It actually means the root was floating. It wasn't rooted, the roots go down. This was floating. But on top of that, I walked past this fossil for three days before I saw what was underneath it. It's very hard to spot. There is the cavity left behind by another trunk. But if you follow it, it attaches to a root there and a root there. Here's a close-up of it. You can see the impression from the bark. It's fallen out of the cliff. There's the root. There's another root. This is an upside-down stump. Last I checked, trees don't grow upside down very well. Last I checked. <laughs> Again, what makes more sense, that they grew in place or that they were catastrophically buried there? And in this case, it was an 18,000 foot thick catastrophe. We're talking a global flood here. This is key. I cannot emphasize this enough. There is only one reason for believing in an old earth. And I may step on a few toes here. I hope I don't step on toes here with you folks. But I know by video and by television, this may step on some toes. I hope they'll please forgive me. But the bottom line is this. The old earth was only introduced for one reason only. And it was to explain away the biblical account of a global flood. That is the only reason the old earth was introduced. In effect, if you believe in an old earth, you are saying there has been no past global flood, and no past global flood, if you deny that, means you also deny the scriptures and their validity and authenticity. Ouch or amen. <laughs> so that's the bottom line. Okay, I hope I don't step on too many toes. I'm going to come back to that because most people, especially Christians, there's a number of them, who believe in an old earth, who believe we may have even evolved, and God used that. I'm going to show you over the next few days why that just doesn't stack up to the Bible and what the Bible says, and why there has been a global flood. Okay introduce to you the history of this great debate, where it came from. Uh, the main point I want to focus on there, of course, is this had nothing to do with science. This wasn't a bunch of geologists that sat around one day, sipping away at their beer, going, you know, I've been thinking, this evidence just doesn't line up with a global flood. It, it's, I mean, clearly the Earth has been around for billions of years. I'm, I mean, I didn't want to say it, guys, but, you know, it's kind of the way it looks. No, it wasn't like that at all. It was one guy who launched a massive deception and succeeded because people wanted to believe it. And uh, Sir Francis Bacon is a very famous individual, a very mysterious individual. Uh, the more I read about him, the more I'm fascinated by the guy. But he had a very devious dark side. But he said something that if you go to my website, you can actually read it because it was just such a profound statement. He said, people prefer to believe what they prefer to be true. And human nature prefers for there not to be an eternity, for there not to be a judgment, for there not to be an eternal consequences. Now, uh, fine young lady, where'd she go? Ask me a question. Uh, apparently she didn't come back yet. <laughs> okay. Oh, there you are. Okay. Uh, asked about... Uh, the differences, for instance, the variations within people. I missed this in, in my introduction. I was, don't know how I missed it. <clears throat> there is what we call microevolution and macroevolution. I don't like the term, but microevolution, as an example, take a look at dogs. And we'll show you this later on. Put a wiener dog, a French poodle, a Great Dane, and a wolf beside each other. That is the amazing variation you can get from one species. And the whole term species has become a very vague misnomer. It just doesn't even exist. 
There really is no definition for species, which is why creationists often use the term kind, because they're each a kind of dog. You follow me there? We have no problem with microevolution, but dogs did not turn into apes or whatever. That's macroevolution. Uh, a lizard evolving a wing would be macroevolution. Okay, so there's, that's the difference. Macroevolution is a major change uh, in a step between one life form to another. So I just thought I'd clarify that real quickly. I'll get into that more often, or more later on. Now, <clears throat> we talked about the idea of the old earth, where it came from, what it led to. And so what I want to step into next is the question, has there been a global flood? This is key, because all of the evidence Lyell talked about is thrown out the window if there has been a global flood. He worked overtime. He spent his whole life trying to discredit the idea of a global flood. I'm now going to disqualify everything he did in less than an hour. You can time me on this, okay? <laughs> the, uh, the evidence for a global flood is absolutely overwhelming. But first we need to ask ourselves the question, what would we, look, what would be, what would we be looking for First, we need to ask the question, huh? <laughs> what would we be looking for if there had been a global flood? That's a key question. Uh, how many people have heard of the idea It was promoted by National Geographic and Discover TV? Oh, okay, Dr. Floyd has. The Black Sea Flood. And that Noah's Flood wasn't really a, no, a global flood. It was just the Black Sea went over its shorelines. How many have heard of that? Okay, a grand total of six, okay. <laughs> well, at least someone was watching Discovery Channel. Anyway, um, let's lay that nonsense to rest right now. Why on earth would anybody suggest this? Think about this for a second. Who is going to build a 450-foot-long ship, take 120 years to build it, collect two of every animal when all he had to do was go to the nearest mountain? It makes absolutely no sense, unless you don't want to believe the scriptures and the scriptural account, which says it was a global flood. The Black Sea Flood is absolute nonsense. Here is what the Bible says. It says, number one, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Get this, the ark did not float until the 40th day. If you're dealing with skeptics, antagonists, and anti-creationists, they will often play up the global flood is happening overnight. For example, they'll argue that dinosaur egg nests refute the flood because after all, how can a dinosaur be laying an egg nest on the bottom of a raging, on the bottom of an ocean in the middle of a raging flood? That's a non sequitur. They've jumped to conclusions that do not exist, okay? I'm going to come back to that. Notice the ark floated on the 40th day, so the water didn't cover the land overnight. It actually took five months. The Bible is quite clear on this. It took 150 days before it finally covered the highest mountain. And this is key. All the mountains under all the heavens were covered by at least 15 cubits. How many mountains? All. Not one or two. Every single one of them. Every single one of them under all the heavens were covered by water at least 15 cubits. That's what the Bible says. It says, everything on the face of the earth that breathed life, breathed the breath of life, was killed. How much? Everything. Not just a few things, everything. This was a global flood. This was not some local flood, as some have tried to explain it away as. 150 days later, the water receded off the land. That's key. All this is key for geology, all key for uh, how life then reproduced after the flood, etc. Okay, now this is what this would mean. We would see layering. Right now, our oceans go up and down twice a day, anywhere between three and five feet. Why? Tides. Are we going to have tides during a global flood? Of course. If anything, they're going to be more dramatic. Even if they only double in size, that's still a 6 to 10 foot tide. That's a pretty big wave. Has anybody tried to go swimming in a 6 to 10 foot high wave? It's pretty powerful. You will get fossil sorting. For instance, dinosaurs typically can be expected to outrun a clam. Typically. 
Sea life is going to be buried first. Why? They're in the water. <laughs> They're already there. They're going to be what's buried first. Humans, being very intelligent, are going to do everything from grab onto floating things to swimming to whatever. Humans will be expected to be buried last, most likely. Mammals, when they drown, tend to bloat and float. So they will tend to either disintegrate or be buried last. Okay, so there's going to be a fossil sorting just by the very nature of the flood. Billions of dead things are going to be buried all over the world in these layers as they're being laid down. Now, here's our fancy high-tech mountain that I drew in Windows Paint. <laughs> there's the mountain, and there's the pre-flood ocean, okay? Now, the flood starts going on. Water comes up on the land, a wave washes in, washes in some sediments, makes a layer. Low tide, water goes back out. Next tide comes in, washes in another layer. Low tide, it goes out. Next wave comes in, washes in another layer, low tide goes out. Perhaps dinosaurs walk out on the floodplain looking for food, possibly trying to look for higher ground, trying to escape. During this time, they've been carrying eggs literally for weeks. They have to do something with them. Either they have to lay a nest or ditch the eggs, so they do one of both. Next wave comes in. Now, this is key. You remember that horrible Indonesian tsunami that happened a couple of years ago, just after Christmas? We learned a lot of things from that tsunami. We learned that one wave can actually form three to five layers from one wave. The assumption in the past has been one wave creates one layer. That's been the assumption. We've now found that that's just plain not true. One wave can lay down multiple layers. Suddenly, we have a mechanism for laying down our rock record. Very simple. Now, when we take a look at rock layers today, again, we're taught, you know, this layer probably took thousands to millions of years. These layers probably took millions of years. These ones probably took millions of years. Okay? Now, all these layers were first originally interpreted by a creationist, a guy by the name of Nicholas Steno, also known as Niels Stenson. That was his Dutch name. He Latinized it into Nicholas Steno, also spelt as Nicholas, Nicholas Stenonis. Now, Nicholas Steno was an incredibly brilliant man. He was actually an anatomist. And he, uh, some fishermen nearby actually caught a large shark, and they brought it to Steno because they knew he was interested in, uh, in anatomy. He immediately recognized the teeth of the shark because on the mountains near where he was, there had been all these strange-shaped rocks that they called tongue stones. He immediately recognized the teeth of the sharks and said, these are fossil teeth. What are they doing up in the mountains? Well, the conclusion was obvious. Noah's flood. He had no problems with that. However, later on, through a rather bizarre conversion to uh, Catholicism, after that, his views changed. And sadly, he actually uh, died. They actually made him a bishop because he was such a smart and well-known man. And he was so impressed by the Catholics... Uh, Basically, what's the word I'm looking for? Where they, they punish themselves? Um, penance, whatnot. He would fast repeatedly, and he actually killed himself as a result of this. He was very young when he died. Incredibly brilliant man. But sadly, uh, wound up killing himself. Now, the four principles of stratigraphy, or strata, the study of rock layers, were developed by Nicholas Stino, and they're still held today. The original principle of superposition. In other words... The lower layers were laid first, and as you go up, these layers were laid last, as you go up in the layers. The principle of original horizontality, all the layers, no matter how they are today, whether they're buckled, folded, tilted, were originally horizontal when they were laid down. The principle of lateral continuity, because they were horizontal and produced by water, those layers continue until they met something like a mountain or a hill, in which case they, didn't, they only encroached up to it, and so the layer will continue as far as it can until it reaches higher ground. And finally, the principle of cross-cutting discontinuities. Big technical words, don't worry about it. It just means if we see a river channel, the layer was laid down first, the river channel was made last, okay? That's <laughs> the bottom line. Or if we find rocks that have fallen down into it, the layer was made first, everything last. 
But you'll notice something changed. Originally, in Nicola Stino's original reports, he did not say, he did not cite the principle of superposition. Instead, he suggested that the layer was laid down, and multiple layers were laid down by different densities of sediments. In other words, a wash of water could come in. What he's saying is a wash of water could come in and make multiple layers. He said that hundreds of years ago, long before the tsunami in Indonesia. And he said that originally, yet later on he recanted and came up with the principle of superposition, which many now call the law of superposition, which is not a law because it's been falsified. It's not true. We now know one wave can make multiple layers. And I'm going to show you, probably within the hour, some experiments I carried out in which we made them right before your very eyes. Dead easy. <laughs> Anybody can do it at home. Okay, let's take a look at those layers again. Here's a key thing, and this is something that Steno noticed. Here's layers A. There's a group of them. There's a really thick layer, but I'll call B. There's a group of layers I'll call C. There's a thicker layer I'll call D. This is in uh, not far from Kodachrome Basin in Utah. Let's back up a little. Notice the C layer actually thins out into just a few smaller layers. B layer actually thickens here. A stays the same, D stays the same. Let's back out a little more. Notice that C actually becomes almost nothing. It thickens out into a bunch of thicker layers and then thins out again. So if we were to take a look at a rock core or something here, the conventional interpretation is that these rock layers took millions of years. No, they didn't. Obviously, they were laid at the same time these ones were. So all these layers did not take millions of years. They happened at the same time. This is actually, a technical term for this is called interbedding. And it happens all over the place. You can actually see interbedding like this that can literally go on for 100 miles or more. And so if you're in the middle somewhere, you look at these rock layers, a conventional geologist will look at those and say, well, this one's older, uh, this one is older than this one. No, they were laid at the same time. Do you see what I'm getting at here? The principle of superposition doesn't work. It do it's been falsified. Now let's come back to the Temple of Serapis. Lyell is correct, the land sunk. However, his idea that a local flood can produce the layers around the world is nonsense. It doesn't work. Here's why. Here's what Lyell did not know. So explain to me how you are going to cover almost one half of North America in an underwater ocean floor mud flow moving 90 miles an hour without a global flood.